This work that you'll hear about today grows out of a project. It's, a, it's kind of a classic piece of anthropological research in that I started with a question that, as Joel said, it has to do with waste and garbage, but it's specifically about the labors associated with garbage. And the, the foundational question is who picks up after us? And the us in this case is defined as New York City. And if you put garbage on the curb as a resident of the city, I'm not talking about private waste or commercial waste, but just as a, as a householder, as a, someone who lives here, it will be picked up by a sanitation worker from the Department of Sanitation. So then the question is, what is it like to be a sanitation worker in New York City today? That's the organizing question around which all of my research centers. Anthropology can't answer any question, certainly not that question, unless it does the history of what precedes the structure of the labor and the demands of the job as they are configured today. So the talk I'm going to give you now grew from the research on the history of the Department of Sanitation and its predecessor agency, the Department of Street Cleaning, and that's all a piece of this larger question, what is it to be a sanitation worker today? So that's the setup. What I'm going to do is read you just a couple of pages. I promise I'm not reading this talk. I'm just going to read a little bit of a description that comes from the chapter. The book is called Picking Up. It's not out yet. Uh, it'll be out from Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux next year sometime, from my mouth to God's ears. Uh, and this is, this is this, the opening of the history chapter. And, and uh, then I'll stop reading and just keep telling the story. So, it seemed like a preposterous idea. Why would New York honor its street cleaners, of all people, with a formal parade down Fifth Avenue, and not just a modest procession, but a major event that included the press, the mayor, and a host of other local dignitaries among the spectators? And there they are. The reputation of the Department of Street Cleaning had been as foul as the city's streets for as long as anyone could remember. By the late 19th century, New York was infamous for its squalid thoroughfares. A significant portion of the department's perpetually ballooning budget found its way into the pockets of local power brokers, while sweepers and carters gave their bosses and ward captains regular kickbacks. Citizen complaints about such shenanigans were met with winks from insider politicos, or with shrugs from resigned observers, while the deplorable streets became a national scandal. But there they were on the sun-filled afternoon of May 26, 1896, the entire street cleaning workforce, more than 2,000 strong, in their startling white uniforms. Some marched in tight formation. Others were at the reins of ash and hose carts drawn by gleaming horses. The animals looked so fine that they seemed fit for private carriages, not for lowly rubbish wagons. Interspersed throughout the parade were ten marching bands to rouse the onlookers' spirits and to keep the men in step. By the spring of 1896, New Yorkers could see, smell, and walk through what must have felt like a city reborn. Streets were no longer buried from curb to curb with shin-high piles of moldering vegetable rinds and lousy wood shavings and festering oyster shells and oozing fish bones and stuffing popped mattresses and staved-in furniture and fluttering rags and overflowing barrels of ash, and heaps upon heaps upon heaps of horse manure marinated in millions of gallons of horse urine, all mashed into shifting berms and ruts by passing carriages, wagons, and omnibuses. Pedestrians no longer had to say their prayers and trust their luck just to cross an avenue after untended snow lay in gutters long enough to turn into a stinking, slippery glop. Householders no longer had to keep their windows clamped shut all day, even in the worst heat of summer to guard against the putrid dust that billowed from the streets. In the rain, that dust morphed into a mud with a nauseating smell. God help the man or woman who found it adhered to shoe soles or skirt hems. The stench permeated forever anything it touched. Instead of these many horrors, New Yorkers witnessed men in white uniforms actually sweeping the streets, all the streets, not just those of the wealthy, several times in a single day with carts following just behind to collect the piles. They saw ash barrels emptied with on-the-clock regularity. Crisp curb lines and elegantly laid paving stones revealed themselves after decades beneath muck. The crowd on some blocks was seven or eight people deep, 
Nearly everyone that stood on the curbstones had some friend in the procession. These particular parade goers had reason to be proud. Their spruced up sons, husbands, and brothers had accomplished a Herculean task. Onlookers who greeted the men with catcalls and raspberries at the start of the parade soon realized that their scorn was outdated. When the marchers that day heard those initial jeers turn to cheers, they understood why. Because of them, New York's streets were clean for the first time in memory. So then the question becomes, how did it get so bad? And to answer that, you kind of have to go back to the Dutch. So what I'm going to do in this talk is something you're never supposed to do in a talk, which is I'm going to hit you with a whole lot of stuff. It's going to be a sort of a mad dash through 300 years of history. And uh, some of it will stick, and some of it won't. But what I hope you'll take away is a sense of the scope and shape and many, many facets that contributed to the crisis that those pictures reveal. So the Dutch arrived in the 18, uh, 1620s. Peter Stuyvesant came in 1647, the most famous of the director generals, to rule the colony. And among, among his early challenges was uh, controlling the pigs, who kept tearing up his garden, enraged him. He might have taken some comfort in knowing that this would be a problem on the streets of New York well into the 19th century. Charles Dickens wrote about this, of pigs bowling over well-dressed ladies on Lower Broadway. He also had the wherewithal to call for a national, or not national, a, a colony-wide day of fasting and prayer when whooping cough and smallpox uh, terrified the colonists. Uh, it was picking off children, and, and uh, it seemed a, um, it was a real threat. And so, of course, he responded as one would in the 17th century. He told them that this was a, a curse from God for being sinful. <coughs> and so everyone prayed and fasted and hoped that they would get better. He also passed the first street cleaning laws ever in the... Uh, in this part of the world. In 1657, it was forbidden to throw any rubbish, filth, oyster shells, dead animals, or anything like it anywhere on the streets. He also had people uh, sweeping in front of their stoops. It was mandated that this be once a week and that they load the carts uh, that came by on Saturdays and that they dump their night soil, that's the chamber pot contents, in uh, specially designated areas, especially designated times of day. Uh, you were not supposed to dump in the canals. And this, <coughs> uh, the pointer. Amanda, do I have the pointer? That's OK. The, the common ditch, that's Broad Street today. And this is another uh, canal called, and now it's Beaver Street. This, you were expressly forbidden from using this for dumping, but it was a very convenient place to throw your garbage. And so they would have it cleaned out on a night and show up in the morning and have it full of dead animals and the contents of chamber pots and all kinds of horrible, stinky stuff. So it's the beginning of the approach of petitioning God, passing laws, and trying to organize labor. And this trio of responses to public waste was basically the pattern for the next while. So the British took over peacefully in 1664. Lovely set of stories behind that that I won't bore you with today, um, they strengthened the same laws that Stuyvesant had put in place about sweeping your stoops and where you could and couldn't throw away your garbage. They, they paved some streets. They filled in those awful canals. They asked nuisance industry, slaughterhouses, tanneries, those kinds of businesses to go to the collect pond. And the collect pond we'll talk about a little bit, the freshwater pond. It was a source of water for much of the uh, settlement for, for many decades, but it, that became a source of problems later on. The, the city looked like it was doing fine. This is uh, the Costello plan. This is in the 1660s. This is also in the early 1660s, right before the, the British arrived. But in 1700, just after, I'm sorry, 1702, there were about 5,000 New Yorkers, yellow fever carried off 12% of the city, which is a staggering number. If you imagine 12% of the current population of the city being felled by a single disease. Uh, again, 
this was surely divine retribution for sinful behavior and New York being founded on commercial interest rather than any kind of religious edict was home to people from all over the world. And other people in the colonies looked to New York and said, well, no wonder you have yellow fever striking you dead. You're all a bunch of evil sinners and you need God and just pray. And of course, people of lower, uh, poorer people tended to die faster. That was proof that they were more sinful. Um, this is a trend that happened not just in the colonies and not just in North America, but it was the medical response at the time. It was inter completely interwoven with ideas of, of the divine and divine justice. In the 1740s, Cadwallader Colden stepped forward. He was a physician, a botanist, uh, a philosopher, he did a survey of the town, and he discovered that instances of disease tended to be collect, uh, tended to happen in greater number where there was greater public filth, where garbage was left, where damp cellars were left to fester, where uh, tanneries and slaughterhouses and candlers and other industries let their effluent out into the environment. People living near or in those kinds of places got sicker more often and died in greater numbers. He published a treatise and because of his work and because he was a man of some influence in the day, laws were passed that were sort of proto-zoning laws. It forbade the nuisance industries from situating themselves too close to residential neighborhoods. Slips were dredged or filled. Uh, night soil and sweeping regulations were strengthened and enforced with some vigor for the first time. Meat and fish markets were moved uh, and laws were put in place to govern the quality of the meat and fish that could be sold. This worked. The next time that there were diseases that swept through, they killed, less, they killed fewer people. And the city was pleased to see that they had had some effect. But as time passed and as industries and uh, stables and uh, breweries wanted to build where they wanted to build, and this was of course a town of commerce first, those laws were let slip and people were not uh, as concerned with them uh, as when Codwallader Colden had put those, had, pr had proposed the measures that were then followed. The Collect Pond became, it was, it was one of the most beautiful places on the island of Manhattan when Europeans first arrived. It was about 70 feet deep covered about five square acres in today's uh, measures. It was uh, people bathed there and put, pulled cooking and, and drinking water from it. They went boating there. But it also was a convenient place to dump, uh, you name it. So by the, by the late 18th century, it was becoming not the kind of place you necessarily wanted to use for water. And water all over the city was becoming a, a crisis. There just weren't enough sources of deep, fresh water to fill wells. So Christopher Coles, no relation to Jerome Coles, spelled differently, uh, was an Irish-born engineer who said, look, we can pipe this in from Westchester. This is not such a big problem. We can solve this problem. So he put together a model uh, reservoir and a pump, pumping station, and he had a big demonstration, and the city was very enthusiastic. This would let them solve the water problem. It would let them clean the streets with water, which other North American cities already were doing, which was a big help in keeping the street stench down and keeping this, the city cleaner. Uh, he debuted this in the spring of 1776. Needless to say, it didn't go anywhere because the British arrived, this time not so peacefully. The Revolutionary War, of course, starts in 1776, and the city's infrastructure is basically shot. So, the population was cut in half by 1783 when the war is over. The city's population has, uh, it's about 12,000. Um, but then it swells again. And by the turn of the century, by 1798, we now have almost 30,000 people and yellow fever attacks again with similarly devastating effects. So. The need for water has never been more urgent. The need for some form of public health, public hygiene, public intervention into the state of the streets has never been more important. And who steps forward to solve the problem but Aaron Burr? 
Now, Aaron Burr, by this point in time, is already understood to be an untrustworthy little devil, but he's also uh, uh, a conniving sort of fellow. And even his enemies say, all right, look, maybe Burr is the man for the moment. And he says, let's pick up on Christopher Cole's idea. Let's bring the water down from Westchester. We'll put in, I forget how many linear feet he proposed piping into, from Westchester down into what is today Lower Manhattan. And uh, the city sees him as sort of a savior. What they didn't know was that in the state legislature, he changed the law after it was approved for the vote. He went in and played with the fine print so that he set up a water company only in name. And what he really did was found a bank. So once he was, and this is a whole other long story that I won't go into now or we'd be here all night, but I can give you the references if you want to read more about it. He founded the water company and charged usurious rates. No one could afford it. He laid very few feet of pipe. And he said to the city, after promising to take water from Westchester, you know what? We're going to use a freshwater pond, which was already a, a, an absolutely unacceptable source of water for any living being. But he had cemented the legalities so that he was immune from any kind. They couldn't, the city couldn't, they couldn't sue him. They couldn't go around him and build their own water supply system. He had the city hamstrung. Uh, this was his, he did build a little reservoir. This was downtown. And uh, on Coente's Slip in lower, lower Manhattan, they've dug up some of the few uh, feet of wooden pipes that were laid by the Manhattan Water Company. But basically, uh, this is the Collect Pond in 1798. It looks bucolic, uh, but it, it was not a usable source of water. He made lots of money. Um, the Manhattan Water Company became a little bank called J.P. Morgan Chase. And apparently the symbol, which is the sort of a square that's morphed into a circle, it, someone has speculated that it's drawn from the original water pipe thing, the wooden pipes that Manhattan Water Company used. I don't know if that's true, but it's a nice note if it is. But by, the, by 1804, he was actually kicked out of the company in 1802. 1804, he kills Alexander Hamilton. His political future is shot, um, no pun intended. And between 1804 and 1811, the freshwater pond is filled in completely. So it's gone. Um, this is it today. You can see that this is, there's some lovely ironies in this image. Um, worth, Broadway's here. Uh, Leonard and Franklin are the same, but. This is Worth Street. And right here is the building that houses the Department of Health. Um, the tombs, which were the prison when the freshwater pond was still there, is still there. Uh, it was on the banks of the freshwater pond. Now it's sort of on top of the collect pond. Collect comes from the Dutch word for oyster shell midden, and it's a sort of bastardization of the Dutch. The, the most rat-filled park in the city's system is the collect pond park. And one of the reasons is because of everything that's underneath what looks like solid ground. When the subways were dug, they hit that patch and had all kinds of engineering struggles because it wasn't solid earth. It was this loamy, land-filled patch. Um, when you go down there and you sort of close your eyes and try to feel it, it's, it's, uh, you, you can, actually. So the city is at the start of the 19th century with not enough water. It's stuffed into the bottom of Manhattan Island here. That's a map of the original waterways of the island of Manhattan by Egbert Vili, a an engineer who wanted the uh, contract to build Central Park, but he lost to that upstart, Frederick Olmsted. Such a shame, said Vili. That's another story. So the city realized it was growing too fast and needed to expand. So it set out to do uh, what has become known as the, um, grid, the commissioner's plan or the grid plan. They surveyed the entire island, and they came up with a plan to put the grid on top of the topography as it is today uh, without any regard for hills, vales, valleys, streams, marshes, Nothing. They just sort of rolled. It's, it's sort of an ur urban planning hubris that I don't think you could get away with today, but that in 
the early 19th century was understood to be a, an engineering miracle. The brains behind that uh, was DeWitt Clinton, who was mayor many times and governor many times. He also was the brains behind the Erie Canal. Now, two things co coincided here. The grid plan let the city grow north faster than it had before. And the Erie Canal, which connected the Hudson with Lake Erie, let a ton of flour move instead of three weeks for $100, it would take six days for $6 to travel the same distance. So commerce suddenly exploded. The city was already the country's largest port by 1797, but once the Erie Canal was in place, I can't imagine what it must have been like to live here then because the population was doubling every 10 years, doubling, so that you had many, many, many more people. Yes, you had the grid plan so that people are, are it, it, the city's being built out as it grows, but not quite fast enough to keep up with all the newcomers. So among the many problems you have are horrific sewage issues, street waste, garbage, public litter, that kind of thing, and the, this water crisis, right? So people are stuffed into, this is Rag Picker's Alley on what is now Little Italy. Um, particularly the poor are, are absolutely jammed into living quarters that are increasingly impossible. Two things happen. Remember Aaron Burr's company still has the city locked. There's no water, right? But two things happen. 17, I'm sorry, 1832, uh, oh, one little factoid that I find absolutely charming. Wrong word. Memorable. In 1832, New York City smelled so bad, sailors knew six miles out where they were on the eastern seaboard. You didn't have to show them a chart. They just put their noses in the air and they would know that they were coming into New York. Okay? So we, we are a national embarrassment, but we're booming. Except cholera makes North American landfall in Canada in June of 1832. By late June, it's come to New York. Keep in mind, New York hears about this and, and locks down. They don't allow any merchants from Canada into the city. No one is allowed within a mile and a half of the city's borders. All ships coming into the harbor are quarantined. Nonetheless, cholera arrives. By late July, there are 100 cases a day. Uh, cholera, as you know, is uh, among its most terrifying facets. It's extremely fast. There were stories of women sitting at their dressing tables in the morning and their coffins in the evening. It's, it's violent and it's, um, of course, they didn't understand its vectors then. They didn't know how it was happening. So once again, God is punishing all these newcomers who are different languages and different colors and different cultures. And they were the ones stuffed most miserably into the slums, especially Five Points, built on the, the filled-in freshwater pond. Five points of the movie fame and of the novels and of the, that was built right over what had been the freshwater pond because that land was terrible. It was subsiding all the time. So it was one of the largest concentrations of the poorest and most recently arrived New Yorkers who died most uh, in highest numbers from cholera. So the upper classes said, well, of course, those people would die first. They should die first. God is just sort of doing some social engineering here and that's how it should be. Except uh, a lot of them skipped town just in case, just in case. Maybe God wanted to get them too. I, I always thought that was a lovely irony. I'm going to judge that you will die of cholera because you're a sinner and I'm not a sinner. But I'm going to go to safety somewhere else. Just, you know, it's a caution. So of, uh, the death rate would be equivalent uh, to, um, there were 3,515 deaths, which would be as if 100,000 people died today. So once again, the city's flattened by this. They're just beginning to recover three years later when the Great Fire hits. This is in December of 1835. It was a um, perilously cold December night. There had been a ferocious fire just the night before, which had exhausted all the fire um, uh, reservoirs. There, were no, there was no more water in the fire reservoirs. The firefighters came out, their hoses froze, they put them in the East River. Their hoses froze before the water could get out. They poured liquor in the hoses and in their boots to keep things thawed. It didn't work. They stepped on them. They crinkled. It's, it, did, it didn't work. The fire 
was so atrocious, it was, you could see it in Philadelphia. Uh, it burned for two weeks. There were $26 million worth of damages. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, 50 acres of city architecture and 700 buildings were destroyed forever. There's some thought that it was set intentionally. That's another aside. So these two crises, cholera and the fire, finally galvanized the city to say we have to have a real water system. So the Croton system, based on Cole's models from the late 18th century, is finally put in place. And uh, the opening celebrations are tremendous. They have water. Imagine when you're so thirsty, you have to buy your water by the hogshead. Lovely old-fashioned measure. It's about 60 gallons. And only the very wealthiest can afford really good water. So you've been raised in New York. You're not particularly wealthy. And you've never actually tasted maybe good, clean, clear, sweet water. And suddenly, not only is it available by, through, by piping it in, but they have a fountain in lower Manhattan where it's shooting 50 feet up in the air. I, it, it must have been like, like some kind of miracle to people living in the city back then. Um, there was some, some of the upper class had suspicions because the Hibernians, that would be the Irish, built most of the aqueduct system, and we know about those Hibernians. Uh, George Templeton Strong, who was an upper class diarist at the time, said that a friend dared to drink some of the Croton water and was in dreadful apprehension of breeding bullfrogs inwardly. Uh, we take it for granted today, but back then, what an extraordinary feat. So Croton water opens up all kinds of new possibilities for the city, including making life for the very poorest even worse because the city built a system for bringing the water in, but it didn't build a system for taking the water out. So you now have gallons and gallons, hundreds of thousands of gallons of water flowing through homes and water closets and all kinds of systems of cleansing the body. And it's going out into the street. It's going out into the gutter. It's going out directly into the river, maybe. But people who lived in some of the basement apartments and some of the buildings built on swampy kind of land, suddenly their basements were a lot wetter than they had been. And their own health and well-being continued to decline. So that the, all kinds of differences in uh, access to public health, basic health, because of class in the city back then. Grissom was a physician. Uh, he worked in the 1840s and 50s. He had a revolutionary insight. He said, look, the people who are dying most prolifically of these diseases are not inherently immoral or debauched or somehow worthy of these sorts of awful fates, their conditions of living bring about the diseases in which, uh, from which they suffer and die. And uh, he proposed building codes. He proposed a, building a sewage system. He proposed, um, um, again, moving those nuisance industries, the slaughterhouses. The street sweeping and garbage system of the city had to be overhauled. Um, and he proposed a health police. Uh, he wrote a treatise, 1845, The Sanitary Conditions of the Laboring Population of New York. Those of you who know public health history, if that sounds like Chadwick, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in London, Edwin Chadwick, the great health reformer and crusader, Grissom was one of his biggest fans on this continent. So, okay. People say Grissom is a visionary, isn't that wonderful, his ideas are great, they're ignored. Politically, nothing happens. Except some of the upper echelon of the city says, well, those lower classes, they're getting kind of uh, rambunctious. They need an outlet. They need a green space. They need a place to go to recreate. Let's build them a park. That'll keep us a little safer. That'll give them a space. A great city should have a great park. So Central Park is proposed and uh, built. and. Uh, it should be a marvelous boon to the city, except that it costs a nickel to get there if you're going to take public transportation. And a nickel is an awful big portion of a working man's wages, so it doesn't actually do much for the working classes. Uh, and by 1860, the uh, death rate in New York from preventable diseases, one out of 36 adults was dying of preventable diseases, one of the highest death rates in the world, despite the fact of the park. 1863, the war is in full swing. The draft riots 
are unleashed across the city. Some of you know about this. There's a marvelous novel called Paradise Alley, which is an account of these th four days in July of 1863, when Irish, largely Irish, mobs uh, go uh, ballistic at the thought that they are going to be drafted for 300, or, or they can get out of it for $300 a man to go fight in the war. And they don't want to go fight in the war. But they, $300 is a year's wage or more, so they can't buy their way out. So they revolt. They uh, lynch people. They burn people alive. They shatter businesses and homes. And uh, it's a horrific moment in the city's history. The city then catches its breath when this is all over and says, OK, these teeming masses are beginning to not just get rambunctious, but they're actually downright dangerous. We really have to do something to help improve their living conditions, to help improve their overall lifespan, to help give them a better future. But Tammany is in control of city government by then with a very firm hand. This is Boss Tweed. And Boss Tweed's approach to um, street cleaning and garbage removal is uh, lackadaisical at best and thoroughly corrupt at worst. So he has these um, ragtag bands of scavengers out there who are uh, making their living and giving kickbacks and who are, many of them ostensibly working for the Department of Street Cleaning, but in fact, they're, they're doing very little and the city is getting dirtier and dirtier. Um, 1874, the city comptroller steps in and says, look, this is ridiculous. We can't have street cleaning done so badly. The Department of Street Cleaning should be its own entity. But Albany and the city uh, common council dither on this. And they finally, in 1881, let street cleaning be its own entity, but with no power. So now the city is becoming a scandal of even greater magnitude because the public has finally begun to understand that even if we're still doing uh, blaming God for disease, and even if we're still uh, deep inside of the miasma theory, I didn't talk about that much, but you all know what the miasma theory of disease transmission is. Bad smells cause disease, in essence. A funky smell of, say, a compost pile to a miasmist would be of, you should never go near a compost pile because those smells will cause you to fall ill, with very specific diseases linked to very specific kinds of smells. But the city is still horrifically smelly, and people are dying at rates that they shouldn't, uh, worse here than any other place in the, uh, in the country. Infant mortality by 1870 is 56% higher than it was in 1810. Um, in fact, let me just pause. This book, I won't read from it, although I'm tempted. This is the synthesis of a public survey done by physicians who fanned out across the entire city in the middle 1860s and came up with a 17 volume report that was block by block, ward by ward, house by house. They had sketch artists with them. They queried individual residents of and businesses of every neighborhood. And this particular book is full of these most amazing maps. The 17 volume version has even more amazing maps. But it was for naught because the corruption of the city at the, by then was so thorough that they, the, the powers that be had no interest in unhooking the money that they were getting from the kickbacks from the street cleaners and people with contracts for waste disposal. They, they, it was too lucrative. So all of this agitating, often through the medical community, was, was falling on deaf ears. Even um, some of the women's groups got involved, women's groups actually that were founded around like the Women's Municipal League around issues of um, zoning, moving manure piles that were as big as a six-story house that happened to be right next to a school. They didn't, that, those were causes that they took on and it made a difference, but it was still a tremendous problem. Um, some of the uh, media of the time talked about uh, street cleaning in, in particular, a department without an intelligent system, without adequate authority or support, and with the rot of local politics sapping all its energies. Um, the DSC is known even now to hire armies of patronage appointees, and it boasts a workforce made up of all manner of broken down and worthless hangers-on. 
and there's a letter to the editor. Are you aware that the downtown streets of this great city over which you preside, this is to the mayor, are and have been for a long time in a disgustingly foul and dirty condition? What is the reason for such a barbaric, pigstyish state of affairs? Are there not brooms, hoes, sweepers, horses, and carts enough to be had, and men enough to operate them? Or has the street cleaning department been bought off by a soap and laundry trust? This one is a little prescient, because of course, we do generate energy now from waste. Uh, the, all of Manhattan's waste now goes to a, a household waste, goes to a waste to energy facility in Newark, and it powers about 10,000 homes in the vicinity of the facility. It doesn't look like that, though. This is a charming one that, again, points to people understand that public health, that street cleaning has a lot to do with disease, the spreading of disease. And this, this series of cartoons uh, harkens back to its, its charmingly um, tongue-in-cheek. And again, remember I mentioned the pigs, right? Happy thought. We return to the simple ways of our grandfathers, and the streets are cleaned once again, more or less, by the pigs. So among the many things that unseats Tammany, uh, the scandals are, by today's standards, um, just staggering. I mean, we hear about political scandals today, and they're shocking and discouraging, but ain't nothing like it was when Tammany was in power. 1894, the Lexow Commission reveals police graft and corruption of uh, hundreds and hundreds of police officers throughout the city were on the books of brothels and bedding parlors and places where um, they're supposed to be protecting us, protecting citizens from these forms of vice, but in fact, they're deeply implicated in them. Street cleaning was still underneath the aegis of police. So it's unhooked from police. And Tammany is voted out. And a brand new <coughs> administration is voted in uh, in 1894. Oh, this is part of, this is, a, this is a little piece of tourism. If you were a wealthy person in the early 1890s and you wanted to go see how the other half lived, you could, this is on West Broadway in Lower Manhattan, and notice the handkerchiefs, they were scented with violet so that they wouldn't be overwhelmed by the stench from the barrels. But notice there's somebody working over there, right? I mean, this is not just, there's a scavenger over there. So this kind of condition uh, helped bring down an entire political regime. And Strong appointed he asked Teddy Roosevelt to be commissioner of street cleaning, and Roosevelt said, no way. So he let Roosevelt become commissioner of the police department. And he put a sanitary engineer named Colonel George Waring into street cleaning. Waring did a couple things. He took this lot, and he turned it into this lot. He put those parades together. He put them in those white uniforms. Ridiculous, right? You're out picking up ashes and dead animals, and Lord knows what off the streets of the city, and you're wearing white? Well, white already connoted medical authority. Uh, the helmets were the same as what the police of the day wore. And it's a whole lot harder to sneak into the pub for a quick pint when you're dressed like that. So there was also the element of surveillance. He put a very strict military hierarchy in place with absolute direct accountability of foremen and superintendents for the work that their men were supposed to do along very defined routes um, that had very clear goals that they were to reach each day. He made sure that the animals that pulled the carts were up to the job. And he got some of the finest horse stock. Uh, I, f I don't know what breeds were ideal for pulling the weights and doing the work that these horses had to do, but huge scandals behind street cleaning about horses being condemned sold to the um, rendering plant, and then the rendering plant would sell them back to the city. So they were condemned and sold for two bucks, and then were sold back to the city for five bucks a head. So he ended all of that. He had first-class veterinary care for the horses. Um, the men themselves were understood to be responsible in ways that they had never been before. He even took what was a thriving, informal scavenging uh, class or uh, operation and turned it into the nation's first recycling 
effort. He had people put three different kinds of barrels on the curb, and the ashes, the things that could be burned for energy, and the things that could be uh, used for compost were all separated. He, had he invited technological innovations. This is a street sweeper from 1896. And through his work and through his men, he turned things like this into this. You've seen all of the negatives so far, but I'm now going to show you the afters. That's the same place. These are all from Harper's Magazine, from a, a two-page spread. After he was gone, the city reverted to what it had been, because Tammany found itself back in control. But it was never again understood Tammany had always said it couldn't be done. We couldn't clean the city. It was too complex. It was too crowded. It was too diverse. It couldn't be cleaned. But Waring had showed them that they were wrong. And so even though he was only in office for three years, his, uh, his legacy was part of the uh, heritage of public service and the progressive era political impetus to use government as a means of improving the lives of everybody, not just the wealthy. Uh, I will conclude with a quote from Jacob Rees. Wearing, after he was out of office, excuse me, he was invited to Havana, Cuba to help them solve the problem of yellow fever there, which was decimating the citizens of that city. And their issues with sewage and street waste and garbage were similar to what New York had been grappling with. So he went there. To the end of his life, Waring was an unrepentant, an ardent miasmist. The, he was an anti-contagionist. You didn't catch disease from germs. That's nonsense. You caught disease from bad smells. So he went to Havana, where he contracted yellow fever. He came back to New York, and he died in October of 1898. In 1902, in his book, The Battle for the Slums, Jacob Rees wrote, it was Colonel Waring's broom that first let light into the slum. His broom saved more lives in the crowded tenements than a squad of doctors. It did more. It swept the cobwebs out of our civic brain and conscience. So that's my talk. It's a little unwieldy. You see I try and stuff a lot in. I'm sorry if it didn't work. Uh, and I wish I could show you the film. It was not unusual to see workers of a specific occupation stage parades. The very first Labor Day parade in this country was in 1882 here in New York from Chamber Street to Union Square. But it was absolutely radical to have a parade just for street cleaners in 1896 because of their reputation until Waring had taken over. He'd only been in office for 15 months when the, the f inaugural parade took place. This one, of course, is a few years later. But it, it was covered by the press in this sort of breathless kind of like, what? Street cleaners on parade? That's harebrained. But wait a minute. Let's look at what, in fact, these guys have done in a way that the city hasn't seen in anyone's memory, in anyone's memory. I don't think New York was clean from the Dutch. Uh, maybe that's an exaggeration. But the stories that you read when you, when you read the the public health history about New York, Ooh, what a difficult city it would have been to live in unless you were very wealthy. And then you hired your own street sweepers and your own street cleaners and your own water supply and whatnot. But for the rest of us, until these guys came along, it was, uh, it was a difficult town. <laughs>